Hello, I'm Arlene Herson, and tonight I invite you to meet a man who has proven that the American dream can be a reality, a man who came to this country an immigrant, who not only mastered a new way of life, but became a master player in the game of business. A financial genius, he built an empire, a conglomerate that today is worth over two billion dollars. And that's just his business assets. Personally, he owns the Riviera Hotel in Las Vegas, a 727 jet plane, a helicopter, and a company that produces motion pictures. His most precious possession, however, is his beautiful and successful wife, actress and singer Pia Zadora. He's a man who has proven that being successful in America is not just a dream. You can make it a reality, and he certainly has. My guest is Mishulam Rickless, Chairman of the Board and Chief Executive Officer of Rapid American Corporation, and we'll meet him right after these messages, so please stay right there. I'm Arlene Herson, and we're back with my guest, Michelle and Rickless. We're here in his office in Trump Tower in New York City. Thank you for having us here. You're welcome. In this beautiful office, I must Thank say, you, in this very special building, but with a very special person. And you have made an incredible success of your life. As I mentioned in the introduction, you came here an immigrant. You weren't exactly penniless, but you didn't have a lot of money. You have become an incredible success story. Do you think you could have done this if you had stayed in Europe and didn't come to the United States? Oh, I don't think, I, not only I don't think it can be done anywhere else but in the United States. I don't think any opportunity uh, could be uh, equal anywhere else in the world. There's only one country and this is it. <sighs> and you knew how to take advantage of it. Well, yes and no. I mean, uh, the, the success that I have made is based basically on the on certain given things that uh, every American has, plus a little bit of ingenuity and a lot of hard work. Okay, you say certain given things that every American has, for instance. Oh, the ability to go to school, the ability to study, the ability to observe, uh, the ability to be free to uh, do certain things without restraints and of uh, family connections, uh, which uh, nowhere else, you can't do that in England or in or in uh, Italy or in Japan. Okay, well, a lot of people can't do that in the United States of America either. You came to this country, you lived in Israel. You were born in Turkey. I understand the family was on the way to Israel. You on the way from Russia to Israel. Okay, you were in a hurry? Did you come Yes, early? I was in a hurry. I'm a seven months baby. Oh, uh -huh. okay. <laughs> so I didn't make it, did you? but you lived in Israel. Right. Um, you grew up in Israel. You were a math whiz, I understand, in Israel. You participated in everything. Um, athletics, uh, even though I understand you didn't excel, you did it. Was that, you seem to have had a have Just had a as then I am today. I excel in nothing, but I do a lot. <laughs> okay, not true. <laughs> not true. Well, I think it is. I think that uh, basically uh, I have been uh, lecturing and uh, preaching about the, uh, the abilities and the opportunities and the, uh, and the creative things that one can do ever since I was a member of Young Presidents and was privileged to be one of the most uh, sought after speaker about mergers and acquisitions. And that goes back to 1957, uh, and look what's going on today. Okay. Everybody's doing the same thing that I did 30 years ago. <laughs> and they learned from you. As a matter of fact, there was even a book that we have here called The Magic of Mergers, written uh, actually uh, a long time ago. I think it was about 12 years ago, if not it more. It was written in 1966. It's 20 years oh, ago. Oh, my God. Well, okay. <laughs> well, and then it was it, The Magic of Mergers, the saga of Michelle Weekly. So you can imagine, in the last 20 years, I had Plenty of opportunities to go down twice and come back up again. Okay, but I want to take you even, even way back before then, even more than 20 years ago, before even you came to the United States, because we all have people who influence us. You have made millions of dollars, but there was one man that you drove for when you were in the British Army, when you were in Israel. You were 18 or 19, you joined the Army. There was a man who you said your life would have been ordinary had you not met him. Why did he make such an impression? I'm talking about from a point of view of uh, morality 
and uh, uh, upstandingness, if you if you can explain what that is. It's uh, in other words, this is a man who morally is probably one of the most uh, righteous people that I have known. By the way, he was at one time recommended to the presidency of uh, of Israel by the uh, Begin. Uh, government, begging uh, political party, but uh, he lost out to uh, an opponent was recommended by the Shimon Peres uh, party. Uh -huh. But, uh, you know, being a young man and uh, traveling so much, we spent together a long time and we were driving together and we were talking about the, uh, the stories of the Bible and the, uh, and the moral laws of, uh, of the Jews. and. He had a great influence on the fact that uh, I felt that after that uh, I had to sort of uphold all the principles that he was talking about. And the interesting thing is that they say that one has to be a real uh, son of a gun uh, in order to succeed in business. That's really not so. The saying that nice people don't win is absolutely wrong. And I know that the perception is that I'm a tough, that I am uh, a mean guy. The, the truth is exactly the opposite. And all the people around me here uh, prefer that I don't negotiate and uh, and don't do the work because I'm a pussycat. Okay. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that's it. I've heard that too. But people assume because you've made so much money, that's because right. you've been so successful, because you're so rich and live such a flamboyant life, that you've got to be a bad guy. Well. First of all, yes, I have made a fortune. Yes, I have made a very substantial fortune. Yes, I have made an unusual fortune. But uh, I have not started out to make a fortune. Uh, my claim to fame has been, and my lectures have been, not so much the fortune, but the power that one gets by controlling a tremendous amount of wealth. You talked about the fact that my company is worth $2 billion. It is not worth $2 billion. It has sales of $3 billion, <laughs> but it isn't worth $2 billion. That, that doesn't mean to say that uh, in today's environment where people overpay for corporate assets, that it may not be liquidated in excess of a $1 billion or, or close to $2 billion, but it is, does not have the net worth of that kind of money. OK, wait a minute, but you came to this country in your 20s, early 20s, with a wife and a child and $3,000. That is correct. Where did you find that? <laughs> <laughs> I found out a lot about you. That was all the money I could get okay. between myself and uh, my wife and my mother and father and her mother. Now, you know, $3 billion you're talking ah, about. But you see, it's not money that makes money. It's thoughts that make money. It's creativity that makes money. That money that I got was only one year of college, but I went for five years to college. And uh, what I learned in college is what made me the money, or what gave me the opportunity to achieve what I've achieved. Well, you make it sound very simple. Uh, but it is simple. It is very simple. Uh, I have expressed that point of view many, many times to many, many people. It is very simple. Don't come to me and say, how do you do it? I can't tell you. Don't come and say, uh, tell me the way and I will go. I mean, each one of us has to create a desire to achieve something. Once you create the desire to achieve it, then don't try to go left and right and, and find all kinds of uh, bypasses but go straight into where you want to achieve. Okay, again, easy said, you were in your 20s. You had to have, well, when you say it's not the money, it's the power, you had to have money to start with. You were just a kid. How did you get people to invest with you, to give you, to okay. trust you? Very, very interesting, because um, you have to be a salesman, basically. I started out by going to school and and studying, and one of the one of the days, uh, the professor has asked us to find a company that has more cash in the till than the stock was selling for. I found a whole industry, 
and it sort of uh, lit a match. And, and, a, and stars were going through my mind. I mean, can you imagine, Wickless, if you can buy all these companies that have more cash in the till than, than what the stock was selling for, that means for every dollar you invested, there was two dollars that you can control. And uh, then I went out to try and achieve it by uh, making a study of a lot of companies. And I created what people already forgot what it is, but I created a, a, um, a, uh, a, d a description of it as uh, Prince Charming kissing uh, the, the Sleeping Beauty. <laughs> and these are known as Sleeping Beauties. Find the companies that are Sleeping Beauties. Today, certain of these brokerage houses and, and arbitrageurs spend millions of dollars in, in research uh, facilities to find the Sleeping Beauties. Yeah, you talk about the Sleeping Beauties, and because of them, you're leading almost a fantasy in life. We want to talk about more how the Sleeping Beauties, how you know, you've become Prince Charming. <laughs> but uh, we're going to take a commercial break right now, and then we'll come right back. Okay. Well, we're speaking with Michelle and Rickless. We're here in his office in Trump Tower. We'll be right back after these messages, so please stay right there. I'm Arlene Hurston, and we're back. We're with Michelle and Rickless here in his office in New York City. And uh, we were talking about the fantasy life, about the sleeping beauties that you found, meaning the companies that you could take over. But it is almost a dream. When you came to this country, you mentioned you, you know, had $3,000. You had to support a wife and a child by teaching Hebrew at the same time that you went to school, to college to better yourself so that you could do the things you're doing now. Did you ever dream, I mean, let's face it, this is not the real world for most people. You not only, you know, have this magnificent office, you own your own 727 jet, a helicopter, houses in Malibu, in uh, Beverly Hills, in New York City. You own a, the Riviera Hotel. I mean, I don't even speak about your business assets. You produce motion pictures. Did you ever dream that this would really happen? Well, uh, you are right. Uh, the quality of life and the kind of life that I lead is really very much of a dream. Uh, maybe I am uh, too spoiled and I don't look at it from that point of view of having a, uh, a helicopter and a G3 and a 727 and homes in the West Coast and the East Coast and the ability to travel at the kind of comfort and uh, in between. Uh, it is true, it is almost an unbelievable dream. I don't particularly look at it that way. It, we use the transportation as means of transpo transporting ourselves from one place to the other. Not so much as the comfort. There's a question of security, there are questions of, of comfort and, and uh, being that we are workaholics, but both Pia and I, uh, it is very important that we just don't spend the time in, in, in airports and so on and so forth. So. Okay, when you mention, when you say Pia and I, now we haven't even talked about this yet, and we will before the show is over, but you're talking about your wife, Pia Zadora, who I right. mentioned in, in the introduction, uh, a star in her own right. Uh, now, I kind of wonder, because you are, we're talking about all your money, all your success, Many times, uh, because of Pia's recognition, you're introduced as not Michelle and Rickless, multimillionaire, successful businessman, but as Mr. Pia Zadora, Pia Zadora's husband. How do you feel about that? Oh, I love it. <laughs> as a matter of fact, if, uh, if you want to be successful with the ladies, uh, all you have to be known is Pia Zadora's husband, and they know she's married to a very wealthy guy. So it's right away a very good introduction <laughs> to all the girls. And, and knowing Pia, it's got to be a very sexy guy, too. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, but you know, peaches and cream, it all wasn't peaches and cream. There was a time in 1963, and I think maybe again in 1971. 74. In 74, okay, that everybody thought Michelle and Rickless is washed up. The McCrory Corporation was in a lot of trouble. 
Rapid American is the parent company. People were calling it Rancid American. I'm sure you heard that. Uh, they thought that you owed hundreds of millions of dollars. Everybody thought you were finished. What happened? Well, I didn't think so, and, <laughs> and I kept on walking, and then I was very able to pay. Sure, we, Rapid American owed over $650 million to the banks alone. The banks alone. I personally owed uh, in the tens of millions of dollars, and uh, my other companies, the Riviera Hotel and others, owed a lot of money. But I went back to work. I was semi-retired in 1970 and uh, sort of uh, roamed around uh, the world between 70 and 74 and returned after the war of October in, in the Middle East, returned back to find my company almost in ruins. So I sort of went back to work and uh, moved the people that were in charge aside and took over and for the next 10 years and with the help of PR, uh, that, uh, I was able to bring the company back into uh, where it is today. Okay, now that happened when you say, you know, again, you make everything sound so easy, but people said that time you were going through perhaps we might call a midlife crisis. You had been married to the same woman for almost 20 years, for almost 30 years, long time. Your marriage broke up, you became a single person, you really didn't pay attention to your business. What happened? What made you decide after 30 years of marriage? When did you decide that this well, wasn't right? <clears throat> I don't think it's important uh, what and how the decision was made. I think it's um, important to know that in the three years between 70 and 74, I sort of uh, was in a very much of a self-destructive mood. And uh, maybe it's because I was going through a uh, uh, a mid-life uh, uh, crisis. Maybe it was because uh, I could not find a reason uh, to live and to uh, create. Or maybe it was just uh, pure laziness and, uh, and, uh, and, and idiocy. But uh, between 70 and 74, I was not paying much attention to the business. I was semi-single and uh, ran around a great deal. Um, towards the end of that period, I was officially uh, separated. And um, all that would probably have continued if it hadn't been the fact that the war in the Middle East uh, kind of created a severe depression in the whole world, in the whole Western world. And that depression affected my companies. And when I came back to reality, I realized that unless somebody goes down to work, uh, gets back to work and uh, start getting things organized, that the uh, result would be uh, a, a total disaster. Okay, but you wonder how you pull yourself up from something like that. I, I had read that a man whose career that you had followed, I think his name was Eli Black, had thrown himself out of a window and that you had been tempted to do the same thing. Did you feel that desperate? Oh, absolutely. Well, Absolutely. There was a lot of people around will tell you that there was uh, it was one of two things. Either you get back to work or you throw yourself from a window. Uh, Eli was a very good friend of mine. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, his decision uh, was to, uh, to go down from the uh, 43rd floor. Uh, my decision was that I didn't have as much courage as he did. And, uh, oh, no, and, no, no. Uh, <laughs> I had to face, um, I had to face the, uh, the, the, uh, the catastrophe. Okay, but how did you? Well, I had to get back to work, and I worked 20 hours a day, seven days a week, for uh, two or three or four years, uh, with very little in between. Uh, and. Um, I think that's probably when Pia got hold of me. I mean, uh, she was very uh, conveniently available for dates, and I didn't have to make the dates too much in advance, and she was always there waiting for me, and it became very convenient and very comfortable. That's it. I want to talk about that. We're going to take a break, because now it's a whole new life. You know, we, we talked about now everything is peaches and cream. Uh, we're going to take a break, and we're going to come back and talk some more. We're speaking with Michelle and Rickless here in his office at Trump Tower. We'll be right back after these messages. Please, don't go away.
I'm Arlene Hurston and we're back with my very special guest, Michelle Reckless. Um, I feel that you've lived many, many lives and your life now with Pia Zadori. You mentioned you met her, she was 17 years old. You were 47, 30 years older than she. It was a time, you mentioned, that was a bad time for you. We know now that she was the best thing that could have happened to you, but then people said, Michelle and Rickless, he's gone crazy. You had a lot of criticism. Your parents even left the United States. They were so upset about your relationship with Pia. How did you react to all that? Well, you said it. I mean, uh, I could have made a lot of money if I had taken bets as to uh, whether the this marriage will hold one year, two years, three years, four years. Nobody would have taken any bets at five years. I could have gotten a thousand to one. <laughs> but we are married now. We'll be a uh, ten-year married. It's been a fabulous marriage. Uh, Pia is an unusual person, very tough and uh, extremely uh, fair in many ways. She's a bitch in many ways, too. <laughs> and uh, by being a very demanding person of, of life as husband and wife. You know, I have interviewed Pia. She's been on the show twice, and I'm a big fan of Pia's. Uh, she has her career, and her singing career is doing marvelously. Uh, she's appeared in the movies. You've been very involved. Now, Pia has been in two movies, Butterfly and um, Lonely Lady, both of which showed a lot of her body, not a lot of her talent, which she has a lot of. She's also appeared in Penthouse Magazine without her clothes on. Now, I understand you approved of all of the nude shots of Pia. Didn't it bother well, you? Well, first of all, of course it bothers me. You, you, I, I, wouldn't have, I would have preferred not to have her do uh, nude scenes. But what's so bad about it? You go to the beach and you find uh, everybody walking with bikinis that are it's much more sexy than a nude uh, scene. And you go to Europe and you have beaches with nude, uh, nudity all over. Uh, Butterfly was the first time that she was told that she's going to have to do uh, a semi-nude scenes. And uh, I wasn't there when she did it because I didn't want to get aggravated. But uh, there are 20 people around when she does the nude scene. It, it, there's not anything that she is in the arms of a, of a lover, nude, in, in the forest all by herself. I mean, uh, it's, 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 it's a job. And uh, as far as Penthouse, she did that because I encouraged her to do that, because she was required to promote the movie, Lonely Lady. It was a lousy movie, but she was required to promote it. And the movie had nudity in it, unfortunately, the, director didn't know the difference between uh, nudity and, and sensuality, and it, it came out terrible, and the whole movie is terrible. Okay, I agree, but what is not terrible is the relationship that you and Pia have, and I agree with you. I asked that question because I felt I had to, but uh, I know you're very proud of Pia. You're proud of all of Pia, um, and she really is a terrific lady, but I read in one of the books that you have achieved almost everything that you have wanted. A recent, as a matter of fact, an article in Penthouse Magazine, speaking about Penthouse, we really only have something like 30 seconds left. You said you've achieved almost everything that you have wanted to. What's left? Well, next March, when the boy is born, I will have <laughs> achieved everything I wanted to achieve. <laughs> OK, well, that is really because uh, you have a daughter with Pia, uh, Katie, who has been on my show. As a matter of fact, Pia, uh, Katie even performed w with Pia. And, uh, and you know that you're going to have a baby boy very shortly. And you have to promise me to put the boy on the television, too. That is a deal. <laughs> I've had his mother, his father, his sister, and now the boy. And right. I really uh, I thank you very much for taking the time from me. Thank you for session. having me. Thank you. I hope that you have enjoyed getting to Mishul and Rukhlis. I know that I certainly have, and I hope you join us again next week. Meantime, hope to see you then. Good night.